Hi, mentalists. So today we're going to be kind of wrapping up our main and primary unit on the major metaphysical problems for physicalism. And I thought I wanted kind of a complicated wrap up lecture for this unit, but hopefully it'll be one that's provocative and that gets you to think about kind of the foundational issues behind each of these major problems for physicalism. And uh, next time we'll start our next unit, which is sort of an attempt by materialists to, to hit back at these dualist problems, taking a second pass basically at these problems. Um, so to get started, I wanted us to talk about this short story that's written by Raymond Smullyan. And he titles this short story, An Unfortunate Dualist. So this is a conceptual problem for dualism. It's the beginning of maybe an attempt to uh, hit back, as it were. In this short story, Smolian imagines a hardcore dualist who, for different reasons, happens to live in existential and painful misery. So content warning. He wishes for nothing more than a swift death. So he would like to commit suicide. But remember, this is, this is a story, this is not a real person, but it's just a person that we're imagining, someone who maybe has some physical condition that makes it very, very, very painful to be alive. So he, he really wishes to, to end his existence. However, he fears committing suicide for a variety of reasons, as we all probably would, um, suicide is scary. Maybe there's a moral issue with suicide. There's all kinds of other things. He, he fears making his friends unhappy. But our dualist hears of a miracle drug that can remove his conscious experience without killing off his body or affecting his function. And remember, he's a dualist, so he thinks this is possible. He believes that there could be such a drug that would eliminate his mental self, but it will appear to everyone else as if he's still alive and interacting with them. So his physical body will continue as normal, just without his conscious experience in it. So he resolves to take the drug the next morning and he falls asleep. Now, unbeknownst to this dualist, his friend who's been watching him suffer um, and suffer like un unreasonably, uh, has at the same time as his his, the dualist resolved to take this drug, he, his friend has resolved to help him out with his dilemma and administer this drug in his friend's sleep. So he does. He injects his dualist friend in the middle of the night, kind of to put him out of his misery, right? And the next morning, the body of the dualist wakes up. And, uh, you know, you can imagine it's without any soul. This body doesn't have a soul anymore if the drug worked. And the first thing the body does is to go to the drugstore to get the drug. And uh, then the body takes this drug and waits the relevant time interval in which it was supposed to work. And at the end of the interval, uh, the dualist body angrily, angrily exclaims, damn it, this stuff hasn't helped at all. I still obviously have a soul and I'm suffering as much as ever. And this is the conclusion of the story. And Simoleon asks, is, is there not maybe something wrong with dualism if this story is narratively plausible according to dualism? Why, why is a dualist committed to a view that the mental properties could just be completely removed and everything seemed to go on as normal? You would get a situation in which this body wouldn't be able to tell that they don't have a soul anymore they would react as if nothing had happened, even though we've postulated that in this world, it just is the case that there's mental stuff that supervenes on epiphenomenally, the physical stuff. So the, the unfolding scenario seems a little absurd, right? <laughs> now, one kind of response that has been given by materialists to such dualist views, and partly for reasons like this, um, is a kind of response that we might pin on people like Gilbert Weil. So people like the philosopher Gilbert Weil 
think that Descartes and other dualists are making a category mistake when they postulate mental substances. So Ryle calls this Descartes myth, the dogma of the ghost in the machine. So Ryle thinks that minds are not things that we have. They're not objects, they're not entities, they're not substances. Maybe even they're not properties over and above other properties. Minds are something that we don't have. Minds are something that we do. And the category mistake is not realizing that minds are already included in the things that we were talking about. So he draws an analogy between um, making this category mistake and going onto a college campus and looking at all of the buildings of the college and all the people walking around the college and asking, okay, so I see the buildings and I see the people, but where, where's the university? Where's the college? You're making a category mistake. There is nothing over and above the buildings and the people. That is what a college is. There's, there's, not, there's not a thing that is a college over and above those things. So it's the same thing, says Ryle, with the mind. If we look at a person and they're moving around the world and they're thinking and they've got a brain and they've got all this physical stuff and we additionally then ask, where's the mind? We're making a category mistake. The mind is there. The mind is already constituted by these things that we have in front of us that we can observe and see and enjoy interacting with, <laughs> you know? Um, they're nothing over and above what people are. Now, Ryle's book on the dogma of the ghost in the machine inspired Arthur Kostler's The Ghost in the Machine, a semi-philosophical defense of emergentism, which is a kind of materialism. And that in turn inspired a number of fictional oeuvres, if you like, a number of fictional works. Um, things like Ghost in the Shell, which takes his name from this phrase that soul is the ghost inside the shell. You know, all of these different fictional universes with thinking androids and robots and uh, kind of enemies for Doctor Who, for example. All of those fictional ovoids are kind of inspired by the idea that maybe there is a ghost in the machine. <laughs> so ironically, these attacks against Descartes ended up inspiring a, a reawakened sense of, of the mis mystery that's central to this experiential life that we all have that might be shared by lots of beings. And maybe it's shared by lots of beings because there's this other component that's, that's not physical. And as is shown by Smolian's fictional thought experiment by his short story, um, and also by these stories like Ghost in the Shell, uh, like Doctor Who, Fiction often expresses our deeper commitments, our deeper anxieties, and our fears as a culture. Many of these fictional works seem to hover between thinking of our material parts as essential to mentality and thinking that mentality is something over and above our material constitution. This is, this is sort of a worry that we have that extends throughout lots of our writing, lots of our storytelling, lots of our narratives. And the mind-body problem fundamentally is a worry about that. Are we, you know, material things? Are we, are we fleshy, gelatinous things? Or are we more than our physical bodies? Do we transcend our physicality? And could there be things that have a different physicality from us that also transcend their physicality? in an important way that makes for a difference in their moral status. And the mind-body problem is sort of at the heart of this. That's, that's the reason why we're doing this. <laughs> it's not just to talk about interesting and fun metaphysical puzzles or interesting and fun thought experiments, but genuinely to try to understand something about existence. I wanna bring to your attention one final piece uh, to wrap up our our first unit here, and it's not that like we're done with the problem. We're going to come back to the problem over and over and over again, but we're going to try it in a new way. Um, I want to bring up this piece by 
Barbara Montero called The Body Problem, and she published it in the journal Noose in 1999. And in The Body Problem, Barbara Montero sort of flips the issue on its head. We might have thought that the mind-body problem is really a problem about minds. What are minds, right? Uh, what are minds? Are they non-physical or are they physical? And Montero is going to suggest that there's an additional problem in being clear on what we mean by the physical. This is a problem that we talked about earlier this semester, but I'm, I'm bringing it to light again because it's very important if we're going to defend physicalism to understand what physicalism is supposed to say. So are mental properties physical properties? Well, what do we mean by physical? Asks Montero. What do we mean when we say we want to exclude the non-physical from our metaphysics? Montero says, quote, not only do we lack a beautiful answer to this question, we seem to lack an answer altogether. For starters, we can't mean simply that there are no ghosts when we say that the world is a physical world, because it's not clear that our concept of ghosts rules out the important thing to rule out, right? Maybe you think that the problem with ghosts is that like they can go through walls. That's what it means when we say that they're not physical. But there are, you know, physical objects that can also go through walls, like neutrinos can pass through walls and maybe most other types of physical entities. Neutrinos just don't, don't have a barrier in that way. We also can't mean uh, that the physical are whatever we use for ordinary concepts in explanation, but that the, the physical doesn't include unusual concepts. We can't say that because beliefs and desires and experiences are just as important for our explanations as rocks and trees and wind and things like that. All of those are ordinary concepts, while other concepts that are important to physics are not ordinary concepts, like leptons and antimatter. So that can't be the way that we decide, define physical entities, right? We also can't mean that physicalism means that everything is made of the same kind of stuff. That might have been an intuitive way to talk, but it's, it's vague, right? What does it mean for something to be made of the same kind of stuff? Montero points out that dark matter, for example, may or may not be made of the same stuff as luminous matter. <laughs> like the kind of matter that you and I are made of is not dark matter. Dark matter is a different kind of matter. And presumably, it's possible at this point that dark matter be made of different fundamental things. And so not made of the same stuff. And that can't be ruled out by our theory a priori. We, we don't know yet what dark matter is. It's a very interesting question. It might turn out not to be different after all, uh, but it might still turn out to be actually different all the way down. <laughs> um, there's things to figure out. So we can't define what is physical and non-physical that way. Finally, we can't mean that physicalism is just the thesis that we're made of the same kinds of stuff as rocks and trees, for example. Since this doesn't rule out panpsychism, but it rules out that we might be made of different fundamental subatomic parts than trees and rocks. And what we want to do is exclude panpsychism, but not exclude the possibility that we're made of different fundamental subatomic parts, as long as they're physical subatomic parts. But notice that that's circular. We can't say that because we're trying to define what is physical and we can't say that what is physical is what is physical. <laughs> So we need a solution to the body problem, says Montero, to figure out what we need to say about a lot of different problems with materialism, problems for physicalism, like the zombie conceivability argument. We need a definition of physicalism to understand what it means to be constituted physically the same, but to be phenomenally different. We also need an understanding of what is physical in order to understand whether Mary learns a new physical fact or a new non-physical fact when she leaves the black and white room in Frank Jackson's thought experiment. We also need a concept of what is physical to understand the causal closure of the physical. What does it mean when we say that only the physical can, can be a cause and all physical effects have physical causes? Even if we don't have a solution to what it means to be physical, we at least need to distinguish between the physical and the non-physical on some basis. We need to say something about 
why the physical is over here and the non-physical is over here. We need to say something about why certain explanations will be adequate for physicalists and certain explanations will not be. So even if we can't define each individually, even if we can't say what makes the non-physical non-physical and what makes the physical physical, we at least need to be able to say what makes these two not be the same, the physical and the non-physical. We need at least a distinguishing characteristic. And even that is not clear or obvious that has been postulated. Montero says that the most common answer to the question of what is physical is the one that we've discussed already. What is physical is whatever the physicists say exists, plus whatever uh, depends on the physical. The non-physical then will be everything else. Everything else that physicists don't say exists and that doesn't depend on what physicists say exists. And suppose, for example, that the physical is the microphysical, right? But we have a problem here with that definition because how do we define what is physical in terms of physics? Do we define what is physical in terms of today's physics or tomorrow's physics? A completed physics or an incompleted physics? This is Hempel's dilemma. Carl Hempel was a philosopher. Hempel says we can't define the physical world in terms of today's physics because it's likely at best incomplete, right? Today's physics isn't a complete theory of everything. We still have some stuff that we haven't figured out yet. And at worst, today's physics is incorrect. It could be that not only have we not found certain things out yet and have more to fill out in our theory, it could be that our theory is actually mistaken and that it's gonna be revised a couple of times before we're done with physics. But we can't define the physical in terms of a future completed physics either because our claim will seem vacuous, right? What does it mean to say, well, whatever the physicists say whenever we're done with this project, like what is the content of our view then? It's kind of vacuous. It, our, our view is nothing. Our view is whatever it's going to be in the future, which is a little bit like saying nothing. Or at best, right, if it's not vacuous, it's vague. We kind of know what physics talks about now, so maybe we kind of know what physics might talk about in the future, but only up to a point, right? Is string theory going to turn out to be true? What do we say about dark matter? What about antimatter? There's just so many unanswered questions. So it's very vague to know what it is that will be and won't be included in a theory of physics that's complete. For example, it's possible that microphenomenal properties will be acknowledged by future physics, although they're currently not. How can we know in advance? For a little while, people thought that the double slit experiment in physics, the ones that, that problematizes whether uh, photons are waves or particles, whether light is a wave or a particle. Some people took the double slit experiment to be an indication that consciousness can affect physical things happening, that observation changes physics. And some people thought that that meant that maybe consciousness was going to turn out to be fundamental. Um, now that, that interpretation of the double slit experiment is now not very popular at all among uh, physicists. There are other explanations that, that don't require saying that, but, but that possibility sort of awoke a lot of people to alternative possibilities for physicalism. So we don't know yet whether maybe a future physicalism will need to include uh, experiential properties among the one fundamental properties. And if physics includes them, does that mean then that physicalism is true? I, it's not clear that that's what we mean now by what physicalism is, right? So we're in a dilemma. We can't use current physics to define what physicalism is, but we also can't use a future completed physics because it would be begging the question or it's like vacuous. We don't know what our statement is. So what do we do? What do we do? How do, how do we distinguish between the physical and the non-physical? How do we define the physical? Uh, Montero notes that dualists do seem to have a way of distinguishing between the physical and the non-physical. And she starts by talking about Chalmers taking a page from Russell, which we talked about these last couple of times. Chalmers and Russell say that physics is the study of structure and dynamics. And that is one way of delineating the physical. The physical is whatever can be explained by reference to structure and dynamics. 
and anything non-physical is anything that can't be explained by reference to structure and dynamics or that doesn't depend on structure and dynamics. Chalmers is the kind of person who has suggested that the intrinsic features of things, those are non-physical, the experiential features. They're not structural or dynamic. Another way maybe of cutting up the physical and non-physical distinction could be to distinguish between the subjective and the objective. The subjective is the non-physical and the objective is the physical. But you might have questions about that way of making these distinctions. We have to have a whole nother conversation about whether these are good um, grounds for distinguishing the physical from the non-physical, right? Is, is physics really exclusively the study of the structure and dynamics of objects? Does it have other things that it might involve in explanations? Um, could it maybe include other things in its explanations? And what about the non-physical, right? Is the non-physical intrinsic? Is the mental intrinsic? <laughs> Does it mean to be intrinsic as opposed to something else? Does consciousness not have a structure or a dynamics? All of these questions just pop up. So, and also with the subjective object is just a distinction, you might wonder whether it cuts at the right joints between the mental and the non-mental, the physical and the non-physical. Are those the same as the objective and the subjective? So just ask yourself what works or doesn't work about this as the way to make the relevant distinction. Montero moves on from this problem because she's like, well, okay, I don't know what to say about that. That could be an impossible way to distinguish these two things. But there's another final solution we could consider to the body problem. And that could be to say that what is physical is simply whatever exists. And that might feel to you at first like a bad answer to the question because we wanted a principled way to distinguish between the physical and the non-physical. But if the physical is just what exists, then, then nothing's non-physical. We've just excluded it a priori. <laughs> Nothing is non-physical, so there are no non-physical things. So there's not even a problem of whether the mental is non-physical. And Montero thinks that that's actually an important thing to realize because this solution, while it might not help us with the problem we thought we had, it does help us figure out an angle for the mind-body problem that might be a better angle than talking about whether the mind is physical because Montero thinks that in any case, most of the issues about the mind-body problem don't have to do with whether the mind exists, right? If we say that the physical is just what exists, that doesn't solve our problem because our problem is not whether minds exist, barring eliminativism about the mental. Most of our problems about the mental have to do with what sorts of features it has and what it depends on for its existence. We accept that minds exist. We have them. It's just kind of obvious to us. That's why it's such a pressing issue. It's something that has deeply to do with how we experience the universe. What is experience? Why do we have experiences? Why is there something it's like to be me? Why, like, what is the relationship between these experiences that I have and everything else, right? So here's Montero with a final quote to close us off for today and hopefully initiate our discussion about this division between dualists and materialists and Russellian monists <laughs> and idealists. Here's Montero, quote, I take it that this point about whether mind exists not being the main question indicates that at least for the time being, we should focus on questions other than the question, is the mind physical? To this end, I would like to suggest a question that I think highlights some of the central concerns of both physicalists and dualists. And this is the question of whether the mental is fundamentally non-mental. For it seems that physicalism is, at least in part, motivated by the belief that the mental is ultimately non-mental. That is, the mental properties are not fundamental properties. While a central tenet of dualism is precisely that they are. Of course, the notion of the non-mental is also open-ended. And for this reason, it may be just as difficult to see what sort of considerations are relevant in determining what counts as non-mental, as it is to see what sort of considerations could be relevant in determining what counts as physical. But of course, this is a project for another paper. One advantage, however, is that arguably we do have a grasp of one side of the divide. 
that is the mental side. So perhaps rather than worrying about whether the mind is fundamentally physical, we should be concerned with whether the mind is fundamentally non-mental. And this, I should mention, is a concern that has little to do with what current physics, future physics, or a final physics says about the world." Unquote. So in summary, Montero is saying that maybe the central question is not whether the mind is physical, but whether the mind is fundamentally non-mental, whether the mind reduces or is explained by things that are not themselves mental. And that maybe does capture the core conundrum for explanation, how and why minds might be constituted. Are minds constituted by minds? Is it minds all the way down? Is idealism true? Or are minds constituted by things that are not minds? Things like photons, electrons, neutrinos. You know, are they made of atoms? Are they made of neurons? Are they made of transistors? Are they made of many things? Or only a specific subset of the things that exist? And can you remove mind from the fundamental things that exist in the world? That's maybe the central question here. And I really like this paper as a wrap up for our first unit. I want to hear what you think about her argument. And I want to hear what you think about Smolian's argument in his thought experiment. And I look forward to having a very lively discussion next time. Thank you so much for joining me. See you soon.